Greetings, Mother Factors! My name's Sam, hello, and today I'm here to talk to you all about the little action-adventure game franchise that could, Tomb Raider. But I thought it's not enough to do it on my own anymore. I brought a few friends along for the ride. That's right, it's all-time gaming! Hello! hello. Yes, there's nothing quite like a good old-fashioned Tomb Raid. The mud under your fingernails, the wind in your hair, the peril. Oh, the peril. I enjoy the peril the most. But how did Tomb Raider piss off a French archaeologist? Why was one of the Lara Croft films banned in China? Why was it, Jamie? And why is it okay for Lara Croft to lock her butler in the walk-in freezer, but when I do it to mine, Humphrey, it's abusive and a crime, and turned into a TV movie called The Cruelty of Master Sam? Bloody Humphrey. Two out of three of these questions are going to be answered, so grab your dual handgun, squeeze them into your short shorts, and sharpen your pointy boobs as we dive deep into 101 facts about Tomb Raider. Number one. Tomb Raider, also known as Lara Croft colon Tomb Raider for a period between 2001 and 2007, is a cross-media franchise originating from an action-adventure video game series created by the British video game developer Core Design, located in Derby in the East Midlands. Got it? Good. Number two. The franchise focuses on a fictional English archaeologist named Lara Croft, who gallivants around the planet infiltrating ancient tombs and ruins in search of lost treasures and artefacts. You know, that's what archaeology is. Number three. There have been at least 20 official Tomb Raider games in the history of the franchise. Most have been released on computers and consoles, with a small number appearing on mobile phones. Oh, how quaint. Number 4. The gameplay found in Tomb Raider titles generally involves copious amounts of running, jumping, swinging, shimmying and shooting, in a veritable feast of action-adventure fantasy exploration, puzzle solving and big scary enemy fighting stuff things. They're, I mean, they're romps basically, so you know, who, who doesn't love a good romp? Number 5. Development on the original Tomb Raider game began all the way back in 1993, the year of the Oslo Accords, the Unabomber, and Super Mario Bros. the movie. A dark, dark time indeed, we can all agree. Number 6. With a small number of notable exceptions, the Tomb Raider series has been generally met with critical acclaim, and has been credited as a pioneer of the action-adventure video game genre. There'd be no Nathan Drake without Lara Croft, my friends. Number 7. Tomb Raider was created by three programmers, three artists, and that's it. Yet one of history's most iconic games was the work of a grand total of six people. Back in the early 90s, even the most cutting-edge games didn't require a staff of hundreds of people, unlike many of today's larger titles, which demonstrates how far gaming has come in such a short space of time. Number 8 Arguably, the most prominent member of that six-man team was Toby Gard, who was mostly responsible for creating the character of Lara Croft. Funnily enough, Gard originally envisioned the character as a man, but the higher-ups at Call were understandably worried that the character would read as an uninventive Indiana Jones ripoff, prompting Croft's revolutionary conversion to womanhood. Number 9. Croft being a dude wasn't the only iteration of the character that didn't come to pass. For a time, Lara was envisioned as a militaristic shoot-first, ask-questions-later sociopath, with a muscular frame, short hair, and army-themed outfits. This aesthetic was ultimately abandoned over fears that the character looked too Nazi-like. Invading ancient tombs and stealing their contents? That doesn't sound like Nazis. Oh no, wait, no, I'm thinking of the Amish. Yep, that's a totally different thing. Number 10. Another version of Proto Lara wore light, flowy fabrics and, shockingly, cargo pants, in imitation of 90s Euro rapper Nena Cherry. Other sources of hashtag inspo include Tank Girl, the eponymous protagonist of an anarchic British comic book set in futuristic Australia. Number 11. <laughs> As Lara's look moved towards its final stages, the team settled on the long braided hair, tight top and hiking boots that resembles the Lara we all know and love. Except that character wasn't Lara Croft, but Laura Cruz, a dark-haired South American woman who was, in all likelihood, extremely sassy. Number 12. Unfortunately for Laura the Latina, in 1996 Core was acquired by Eidos, who wanted the game to have a distinctly British quality. So the character was changed once again to the aristocratic daughter of privilege that British people totally relate to because we all live in castles and have doddery old butlers and know the Queen. That's sarcastic, by the way. Number 13. The team changed the character's name by literally just flipping through a phone book for a name that sounded similar to Laura Cruz, but you know, British. Someone saw the name Lara Croft, and the rest is histoire. Hey, number 14. In the original Tomb Raider game, Lara is made of only 540 polygons, which was a direct result of the infamous Derby polygon shortage of 95. It's a real thing. Look it up. I'm not making it up on the spot, I promise. Number 15. Croft's <clears throat> bust size was the result of a horrific industrial accident. Oh my god. 
According to Toby Guard, he was messing around with the character's model one day and accidentally made her breast 150% larger. He was going to correct it, but apparently everyone involved in the game agreed that they preferred Croft with larger breasts. Hmm, how surprising. Yeah, <laughs> which is odd, considering the fact that her chest was literally shaped like a Toblerone box. Number 16. Even though Croft is known for her trademark braid, it was actually cut from the original game due to lack of space. The long braided ponytail was still included in much of the promotional material, which is a fragrant and brazen example of false advertising. What about all the people who bought the game on the understanding that Lara Croft would have a braided ponytail? Number 17. One of the most iconic locations in the first Tomb Raider was built in a single weekend by the absolute ledge that is Toby Guard. Croft Manor was based on the actual building in which Core was headquartered. Number 18. One of the biggest sources for inspiration for Tomb Raider's gameplay were the early Prince of Persia games, which featured similar examples of climbing and jumping interspersed with combat. The team at Core added puzzle solving and elements of stealth to realize the vision for Tomb Raider. Number 19. Additionally, Tomb Raider was one of the first games of its kind that did not use a first person perspective. Most games of the 1990s favoured the first person viewpoint, with the idea that it creates a more immersive gaming experience. Looking back at the graphics in these games, that seems a little ridiculous, but there you go, the 90s were a crazy time. Number 20. Although Guard was pretty unrestricted when it came to creative control over the game, it was pretty obvious that the powers that be wanted to ramp up Lara's sex appeal for maximum marketability, a tactic with which Guard wasn't always very comfortable. At one point, they even asked Guard to integrate a nude code into the game, which, to his credit, he refused to do. Number 21. When speaking about this tension in the creation of Croft, Guard explained that it was never his intention to create a game with a page 3 model crudely shoehorned in as an archaeologist. His vision for Lara was a cool, collected and controlled heroine. You know, like every male hero. Number 22. If you have a quick butchers inside Croft Manor, you may notice that the mother flippin' Ark of the Covenant is collecting dust in the corner of Lara Croft's foyer, which is a pretty explicit tribute to the influence of Indiana Jones. It contains the two original stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, and Lara Croft is all like, yeah, let's use it for decor. Number 23. Despite being known for her trademark, you know, dual pistols, throughout the original Tomb Raider, Croft only actually kills six people. No, instead, Lara Croft likes to fill lions, gorillas, and dinosaurs with lead instead. Nice lady. Number 24. After beginning work on the game in 1993, the original Tomb Raider game was finally released in 1996 for the Sega Saturn, PlayStation, and MS-DOS. Years later, the game was released for, of all things, the N-Gage in 2003. Remember those? Yeah, me neither. And then on PlayStation Network in North America in 2009, and Europe in 2010. Number 25. Initially, Sony didn't want Tomb Raider on the PlayStation as they were extremely picky about what they would allow on their new console, and Tomb Raider simply didn't match up to their lofty standards the first time Core submitted it, and as a result, the Sega Saturn was Tomb Raider's lead platform for much of the game's development. Eventually, Core gave Tomb Raider the metaphorical lick of paint it needed to vault Sony's metaphorical hurdles, who finally led it on their system, so... Number 26. Upon release, Tomb Raider was met with overwhelming critical acclaim. The game was praised for its then-state-of-the-art graphics, captivating environments and soundtrack, and cinematic approach to gameplay. Tomb Raider won several Game of the Year awards, and has since been called one of the greatest video games ever made. Not bad for six guys from Derby. Number 27. Happily, the game was also commercially successful, selling over 7 million copies worldwide, translating into profits of over £14 million for Eidos, a company that had recorded a pre-tax loss of £2.6 million only one year previously. Ooh. Number 28. Pretty much immediately after Tomb Raider was released, Lara Croft became a global sensation, appearing in print and broadcast media often as a sex symbol, which was fairly novel at the time. The amount of attention Croft attracted was previously unheard of for a video game character, forcing publications even outside the gaming industry to take notice. Number 29. As a result, a number of large corporations sought to use Lara Croft in targeted ad campaigns. Probably the most well-known example had Croft appear in the advert for LucasAid, in which she's chased by several bloodthirsty attack dogs, whom she nonchalantly tricks into falling to their deaths. Lara Croft really hates animals. Number 30. Irish rock band U2 used the image of Lara Croft in their worldwide Pop Mart tour. Videos of Croft were used to accompany the band's 1995 song Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me, which I still contend is a plagiarised version of my song Pick It, Lick It, Roll It, Flick It. I may have written that when I was three, but still. Number 31. Croft was even featured on a French postage stamp, 
That's how big she was, guys. She ended up on stamps. In France, no less. Their stamp game is out of control. Everybody knows that. Number 32. In a truly horrifying yet entirely unsurprising attempt to cash in on Croft fame, someone had the bright idea to create not one, but two Lara Croft pop music albums. The first album, titled Come Alive, featured the hilariously oversexualized song Getting Naked, which apparently performed well enough to permit the creation of a second album, titled Female Icon. Despite being recorded entirely in English, both albums were only released in France. Number 33. Once upon a time, Lara was so well known and so popular that she was even more recognizable than the mother effing Pope, evidenced by an online survey in the 90s which placed her above the leader of the Catholic Church. Number 34. Remember how I mentioned that Guard refused to build a new code into the game? Well, as principled as his stand was, it didn't stop someone from doing it themselves in the form of the infamous Nude Raider patch. As you can imagine, the patch, which was only available for the PC version of the game, caused Lara to appear absolutely naked. Eidos eventually sent cease and desist letters to the creators of Nude Raider, much to the disappointment of perverted nerds everywhere. Number 35. During the development of the second Tomb Raider game, two key members of CORE left the team, most notably Toby Gard, who continued to disagree with the constant over-sexualized marketing of Lara. Gard wanted to present Croft as sophisticated and unattainable. Instead, the marketing department continued with its torrent of Lara Croft sleaze, prompting Gard to quit. Number 36. The sequel to the original game, simply titled Tomb Raider 2, was released for PC and PlayStation the following year in 1997 followed up with a port to Mac OS in 1998. By 2003, the game had sold over 8 million copies worldwide, making it one of the best-selling games released up to that point. Number 37. The anguished grunts of Lara's butler Winston in Tomb Raider 2 were provided by Nathan McCree, the game's composer. So they got music and voice acting for the price of one? Bargain. Number 38. Many players of the game will have fond memories of the consequence-free bullying that they were able to inflict upon the long-suffering butler Winston, who would follow Croft around her humble abode. One of the more satisfying pranks to which players could subject Winston was to lock him in the walk-in freezer by leading him in there and rushing out and closing the door before he could escape. Classic prank, Lara. Classic, very dangerous prank. Number 39. Following the release of Tomb Raider 2, Eidos began receiving large amounts of flowers, gifts, and even offers of marriage from Lara Croft admirers from all over the world. God, that's so weird. And that's coming from Captain Jennifer Lawrence here. That's weird. Yes, the fictional video game character Lara Croft prompted literally dozens of marriage proposals, as well as numerous love letters, which employees described as cheesy. Oh, number 40. The third installment of the Tomb Raider series, entitled imaginatively Tomb Raider 3, was built on an upgraded version of the game engine used by its two predecessors. The modified engine provided superior speed, efficiency, colored lighting, and crucially, triangular polygons, ah, which allowed for greater detail and more complex geometry. The game was a return to the mostly puzzle-solving gameplay of the first Tomb Raider, as opposed to, you know, Tomb Raider 2, which focused more on shooting and combat. Number 41. Tomb Raider 3 was a commercial success upon its release in 1998, selling around 6 million copies worldwide. The game was judged slightly less kindly than the first two installments, with critics generally agreeing that the third game failed to bring anything new to the series. That being said, Tomb Raider 3 still received generally favorable reviews. The Meaning of Life In a storage room in Lara's Manor, players can check out a variety of artifacts that Lara has pilfered from tombs she's visited in previous Tomb Raider games. Such relics include the Atlantean Scion and Jade Cat statue from Tomb Raider 1, and the Dagger of Jean from Tomb Raider 2. Jean. Is it Jean? Yeah, you know, unless anyone Chinese watches, I think we'll get away with it. Quality. Not only that, she also decorated the room with a mounted T-Rex head, adding the murder of exceedingly rare Mesozoic animals to her rap sheet. Number 43. The fourth title in the original series, Tomb Raider The Last Revelation, was released in 1999, again to fairly positive reviews. However, not everybody was thrilled with the game's release. The Last Revelation included a character called Jean-Yves, a French archaeologist and friend of Lara Croft. It turns out, though, there actually is a French archaeologist called Jean-Yves Empereur, who is known for uncovering the remains of the Pharos Lighthouse, one of the seven wonders in the ancient world. The real John Eve objected to his likeness being included in the game, which Eidos claimed was entirely accidental. Eidos removed the character's planned appearance in the next game, Tomb Raider Chronicles. Number 44. The next game in the series was Tomb Raider Chronicles, as I just said, released in the year 2000. 
Aside from its conspicuous lack of a certain French archaeologist, the game was also notable as the first Tomb Raider game with which Winston Smith had a speaking role. Shockingly, none of his dialogue included the line, Stop locking me in the freezer, you lunatic! Number 45. The sixth game in the series, Tomb Raider the Angel of Darkness, was released in 2003, and is considered the very first not particularly good game in the series. Though the game's story and soundtrack was praised, the gameplay was heavily criticised, earning it a place on Game Trailer's Top 10 Worst Sequels list. Oh dear. Number 46. One interesting addition to the game was the rather weird reimagining of one of the world's most famous artworks. When Lara Croft visits the Louvre in Paris, beady-eyed players will notice that Mona Lisa's face has been replaced with a picture of the game's composer Peter Connolly. Well, you'd recognise that if you knew who Peter Connolly was, but I'm telling you now, you're welcome. This photo apparently follows a heavy night out. Mm hmm. Number 47. The series was rebooted in 2006 with the release of Tomb Raider Legend, beginning the Legend timeline. An amusing easter egg in Legend can be found in Zip's office in Croft Manor. Inside, there are several post-it notes with humorous messages scrawled on them. Examples include Legal Say No, Get More Soda, and Reboot Webcams in Bedroom. Kinky. Number 48. Funnily enough, the original Xbox version of Legend does not include the introduction movie with the opening titles. Apparently, the manager of the Xbox development team literally just forgot to include it on the final build disc. By the time they'd realised their mistake, time was so tight that IDOS forced them to release the Xbox version without the intro. Number 49. Lara Croft's Tomb Raider Anniversary, released in 2007, was an anniversary remake of the original Tomb Raider game, which uses an improved version of the Legend game engine. Early in the game, during a conversation with Croft, the main antagonist, Napler, says, This is a game you've played before. An oblique reference to the game being a remake, or remake as it's pronounced. Number 50. The eighth installment of the Tomb Raider series, entitled Tomb Raider Underworld, was released in 2008. At one point in the game, Croft is forced to escape a burning Croft Manor following an explosion. As the player guides Croft through the living room, a portrait of her parents hanging above the fireplace can be seen, with the left half of her mother's face burnt off. This is a subtle foreshadowing of a moment later in the game when Croft encounters her mother's reanimated corpse, with the left side of her face decomposed. Number 51. Lara Croft and the Guardian of Light, released in 2010, was the first Tomb Raider game not to include the words Tomb Raider in the title. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Number 52. Interestingly, Lara Croft Guardian of Light was almost a side-scroller. Early on in the game's development, there was a debate among its creators, with some arguing for a side-scroller and others favouring a top-down design. Eventually, each side of the discussion created prototypes of their preferred version to be viewed on screen, which ultimately led to victory for the top-down proponents. Number 53. The Tomb Raider series was rebooted again in 2013, with a game simply titled Tomb Raider. This was the first game in the series to have a mature 17 plus rating in the United States, which absolutely makes a game better. People will tell you that games can be fun without violent sex and swearing, but those people are lying to you. Number 54. Laura's new realistic and more human design in the game led to several comparisons to Nathan Drake, the protagonist of the Uncharted series. You may have heard of it, guys. Hmm. Her clothing is also very similar to Drake's trademark look, which begs the question, who wore it better? The classically curvaceous Lara Croft or the hunky rascal that is Nathan Drake? Tell us in our fancy YouTube poll up there. Number 55. That game was followed up with a 2015 sequel entitled Rise of the Tomb Raider. If you played this game on February 14th, a message appears on the loading screen that reads, Happy Birthday, Lara Croft. Aww. Number 56. Since the release of the original game in 1996, Tomb Raider games have sold over 58 million copies worldwide, making Tomb Raider one of the best-selling video game franchises in history. Number 57. Throughout the years, Lara Croft has been voiced and portrayed by several actresses, the first being Shelley Blonde, who, incidentally, is not blonde. Other actresses who are presumably more honest about their hair colour include Judith Gibbons, Janelle Elliott, Keely Hawes, and Camilla Luddington. Number 58. The Tomb Raider series has been so successful, in fact, that it's been the recipient of no less than six Guinness World Records. These are most successful video game heroine, most recognisable female character in a video game, most detailed video game character, <laughs> okay, highest grossing computer game spin-off, most successful live action transfer, and most official real life stand-ins in a video game. Number 59. As a result of Tomb Raider's success, the office where Core was previously headquartered is now home to a fancy blue plaque, honouring Lara Croft and her creators. Number 60. 
Not only that, but a £36.2 million Derby Road constructed in 2010 has been named Lara Croft Way following a public vote. 27,000 people took part in the survey and the Tomb Raider protagonist won with a staggering 89% of the vote. Public works project not named after a footballer. Thank God. Number 61. As many of you will already be aware, in 2001 the Tomb Raider series was famously adapted into Lara Croft Tomb Raider, an action-adventure film starring Angelina Jolie. The film was almost universally panned by pretty much everyone, and currently holds a fairly shoddy rating of 20% on Rotten Tomatoes. Angelina Jolie was nominated in the Worst Actress Award at the 2002 Razzie Awards, but sadly she lost to Mariah Carey for her role in Glitter. I'm sure it was an honour just to be nominated. Number 62. Before it was confirmed that Angelina Jolie would be pulling on Lara's short shorts, pretty much every actress in Hollywood had been rumoured for the role, including, but by no means limited to, Demi Moore, Catherine Tita jones Charlize Theron, Uma Thurman, Liv Tyler, Kirsten Dunst, Elizabeth Hurley, Sandra Bullock, Ashley Judd, Drew Barrymore, and Cameron Diaz, to name but a few. Even Gwyneth Paltrow was among the rumoured Laras. God forbid. I mean, goop forbid. Number 63. Apparently, Jolie agreed to do the first film mostly because of all the exotic locations she would get the opportunity to visit. She fell in love with Cambodia in particular, and even adopted an orphan Cambodian baby boy who she named Maddox. Jolie brought attention to the war-torn nation. She helped with a minefield cleanup, established several schools, and even set up a 60,000 hectare wildlife reserve, for which she was honoured with Cambodian citizenship by King Norodom Siamoni. Nintendo 64 Initially, Jolie was extremely reluctant to wear the famous short shorts that Lara sports in the games. She eventually relented, both as a commitment to the authenticity of the source material, and because she knew it would make the Tomb Raider fans horn... <coughs> happy. <coughs> Number 65. Awkwardly, director Simon West turned down the chance to make the now classic war movie Black Hawk Down in order to make Lara Croft Tomb Raider. That one probably stings. Ooh, wow. Number 66. To prepare for the role, Jolie received weapons training from an SAS instructor, the Elite Special Forces of the United Kingdom, giving her the ability to star in action films and protect the Queen. Number 67. Due to rumours of substance abuse and her highly publicised relationship with Billy Bob Thornton, which I remind you involved a pair of them wearing vials of each other's blood around their necks, Jolie took a number of drug tests during filming to prove she was mentally competent to appear in the film. She passed every test with flying colours. Number 68. Interestingly, Lara Croft's father in the film is played by Angelina Jolie's real-life father, John Voight, which must have been fun and a bit weird. Fun and a bit weird. Number 69. Craig's character was originally called Alex Mars, but it had to be changed because the name couldn't be cleared by the legal department. Instead, director Simon West decided to give him the name Alex West after his own father, in order to guarantee that they could get the clearance if necessary. Number 17. In the film, Lara Croft is English and her acquaintance Alex West is American. However, in real life, Jolie is American and Daniel Craig, who plays West, is English. Acting. Number 71. The gun that Daniel Craig uses in the Tomb of the Dancing Light is a Walther PPK, which just happens to be the signature weapon of James Bond. He wielded the same gun again as 007 in the 2006 James Bond out in Casino Royale. Number 72. Filming the scenes in which Lara drives her Land Rover through the jungle required numerous reshoots, as snakes, insects, and other wildlife kept falling into the car through the open top roof. Jolie herself was reportedly terrified of the experience, which, yeah, you would be. Number 73. In the scene in which Lara starts smashing the ticking clock with a hammer, her butler uses a silver tray to protect his face. This is an affectionate reference to the games in which Winston the butler will defend himself using his tray if he's shot at. Number 74. The training robot that Bryce creates for Lara, which she battles at the start of the film, is named Simon after the director Simon West. Number 75. Towards the end of the film, Lara encounters a pack of dogs, to which she exclaims, uh -huh. Probably not like that, but let's go with it. This was a nod to the games, in which Croft would say the same thing whenever she picked up an item. Number 76. As in the original game, Lara isn't the trigger-happy maniac we usually see fronting action films. Croft never injures anyone with a gun in this movie, except for one instance where she pistol whips a robber, but he had it coming. Number 77. In the video game, Lara Croft's cup size is 36 double D, which I imagine for an acrobatic archaeologist is quite the handful. <laughs> <laughs> Pun turn into Angelina Jolie is naturally a 36C and was padded up to a 36D for the movie, as it was felt that increasing her bust size to video game proportions would be a tad unrealistic. Number 78. 
Amazingly, Lara Croft Tomb Raider was the first Hollywood film in more than three decades to be filmed in Cambodia. The previous film was Lord Jim, which was shot all the way back in 1965. Number 79. In the great Hollywood tradition of looting sets for souvenirs, Jodie stated in an interview that she kept Lara's holsters and still has them somewhere in her own home. Number 80. In 2003, Lara Croft Tomb Raider was followed up with a sequel, entitled Lara Croft Tomb Raider The Cradle of Life. It was also panned by critics, but made over $150 million at the box office, so, you know, you win some, you lose some. Number 81. Interestingly, model and actual English person Kelly Brook was rumoured to replace Angelina Jolie in the sequel. Clearly Jolie wasn't going to let some jumped up British model take her role as she ultimately signed up for the sequel. Number 82. A number of veteran female directors were rumoured to captain the Tomb Raider ship, including Catherine Bigelow, Mimi Leader, and Catherine Hardwick. The director eventually went to Raw Uthag, who is, unfortunately, a man. Number 83. Sadly, Daniel Craig was not interested in returning for the sequel, explaining in an interview that there are only so many ways you can look surprised at stuff blowing up. Number 84. Angelina Jolie was the only member of the main cast of the movie to be American. Groundbreaking. Wow. Hashtag Lara so white. Number 85. Towards the beginning of the Cradle of Life, Lara is discussing the discovery of the Temple of Luna with some men on a boat, to whom she exclaims, if even half the temple is intact, it will still be the greatest find since the pyramids. Which is a weird thing for an archaeologist to say, since the pyramids were never lost. <laughs> <laughs> on account of them being very, very big. What an idiot. Obvious, when he's <laughs> in Egypt. The Great Pyramid of Giza was the tallest man-made structure for 3,800 years. So not the kind of thing that you lose. Number 86. Despite a general consensus of suckage, the film's over-the-top action-adventure silliness does have its admirers. YouTube film critic Chris Stuckman claims that both the Angelina Jolie-fronted Tomb Raider films are his guilty pleasure movies. Basically, just enjoy it for what it is. Number 87. For some reason, the Chinese government seemed to think that Lara Croft Tomb Raider The Cradle of Life, a critically panned Hollywood movie based on a video game, had been made specifically to disparage them. They were so insulted by the film that it was literally banned in China, claiming that the film damaged China's reputation, giving the impression of a country in chaos with no government and overrun by secret societies. One unidentified Chinese official even said that Westerners who made the film did so with malicious intention. Okay, China. Number 88. The 2018 film, once again titled Tomb Raider, is a reboot of the Tomb Raider film series, this time starring Alicia Vikander in the title role. The film follows, guess who, Lara Croft, on her first expedition as she sets out to solve the mystery of her father's disappearance. So, yeah, just a touch more emo than the Jolie films. Number 89. Like the 2001 Tomb Raider, this film inspired a lot of wild speculation about who would play the lead prior to Vikander's ascension to the role. Actresses like Daisy Ridley, Amelia Clark, Saoirse Ronan and Cara Delevingne were all rumoured Lara's. No jail, although, hmm, odd, she would have been... Perfect, well she's perfect and everything. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Number 90. Luckily, Alicia Vikander was actually a fan of the games when she was growing up. So, you know, take that, Amelia Clark. Number 91. To prepare for her role in the film, Vikander put in some serious hours at the old gymnasium, to the point that she's now able to lift her own body weight. Wow. I can do that in space. <laughs> Just, I've never, never, never been to space. Number 92. Alicia Vikander is not only the second actress to portray Lara Croft in a movie, but also the second Academy Award winning actress. Not only that, but both Vikander and Jolie won their respective Oscars in the same category, Best Supporting Actress. Jolie won in 2000 for her role in the 1999 drama Girl Interrupted, and Vikander won in 2016 for The Danish Girl. Number 93. Tomb Raider will also mark the second time that Dominic West has played Lady Vikander's father, following the 2014 First World War drama film Testament of Youth. Number 94. Naturally, the franchise eventually spread into other areas and followed a number of crossovers with established titles. For instance, Top Cow Productions released the first edition of the Tomb Raider comic book series, which ran from December 1999 to January 2005, with a total of 50 issues made. Number 95. A new Tomb Raider comic book series created by Dark Horse Comics began in 2014, which was set within the 2013 reboot's continuity, aka the Survivor timeline. Dark Horse has created a number of other Tomb Raider comics since then, the latest of which is Tomb Raider Survivor's Crusade. Number 96. 
An animated series based on Croft's exploits titled Revisioned Tomb Raider was produced and broadcast by GameTap. The series aired across several weeks in May and June of 2007, with a total of 10 six-minute episodes. The series was notable for utilising a variety of animation styles throughout its run, ranging from an anime to Looney Tunes to a moving comic book aesthetic in the final episode. Number 97. Not only that, but in every episode but one, Croft was voiced by genuine A-list actress Minnie Driver. They got Minnie Driver, that's actually impressive. Number 98. Four official Tomb Raider novels have also been produced, which follow stories set in between the timelines of the games. The first three, published between 2003 and 2005, were set within the original timeline, and another within the narrative of the 2013 reboot. A fifth book, which followed Croft in a standalone adventure separate from the games, was published in late 2016. Number 99. In 2001, a line of Lara Croft dolls were released. Modelled on Lara Croft actress Angelina Jolie, the curvaceous figures were created for young adults and collectors to enjoy from a distance, rather than play toys for kids. They were, they were smut, basically. Oh my god! I can't believe it! It's number 100! In 2006, Lara Croft was honoured with a star on San Francisco's Walk of Game, joining other video game icons like Mario, Link, Sonic the Hedgehog and Halo's Master Chief. Sadly, the walkway was removed in 2012 and converted into a Target store. Hmm. Number 101! Possibly the most bizarre adaptation of the Tomb Raider franchise is that of... Oh, God. Womb Raider, a softcore adult parody of the franchise. Released in 2013, the story follows Kara Loft. See what they did there? Who, after meeting renowned art collector Dr. Scrotus, yep. embarks on a journey to find three sacred wombs. Oh, God. Wow, that is... <sighs> it's bleak. Anyway, thanks to All Time Gaming for joining me for this wonderful video, and I hope you enjoyed 101 Facts About Tomb Raider. Check out All Time Gaming, but before you do, let me know in the comments, what do you want to see next? Let me know, please, because otherwise, how do I know? In the meantime, here are two videos on screen that you could very well be enjoying right now. Who knows? I know you would do if you clicked on it, though, so do it. I'll see you next time. Sam out! I mean, bye. Lara Croft, motherfuckers.